So the SDGs, um, people have heard of them, maybe? Okay, if you've heard of them, put your hand up. If you, without looking at the wall, can list all 17, put your hand up. <laughs> I was gonna say, if you could list them in order of the colors of the rainbow, put your hand up, we're not there. So we're gonna just start with sort of five or 10 minutes to talk a little bit about what these things are called the SDGs. Obviously, a lot of people have shown up today, which I'm super excited about, um, but it would be good to have a bit of a baseline understanding. So the Sustainable Development Goals were, were launched and adopted in September of 2015. Uh, by all 193 UN member states. Um, it was um, a, a process that draw to conclusion uh, three years of fairly robust community consultation, uh, which saw over eight million people discuss and frame out the issues that mattered most in their communities and on the planet. Um, they, they ended up with 17 goals, um, but they raised 300 issues through that community consultation process. And so tucked within each of these 17 goals is actually a great deal of thought, a great deal of consultation. Uh, and this really is meant to represent um, a, a best guess, I guess, at the issues that matter most and the things that if we were to achieve them over the next 12 years uh, would fundamentally transform uh, the planet. Um, who's heard of the Millennium Development Goals? Who worked on the Millennium Development Goals? Who was excited by the Millennium Development Goals? <laughs> Two, good. Um, this is not the first international framework. There have been many, many international frameworks that come before it. So what I wanted to do is just take a moment to, to, to understand and to share a little bit about why the SDGs are actually pretty different from the things that came before them. Because we know that the UN has a tendency to produce exceptional frameworks, uh, and then when we don't meet those goals, you know, two years in advance, we start producing another exceptional framework with a longer timeline. And the SDGs are actually a little bit different. So again, I, I mentioned the Millennium Development Goals. These were not a set of goals that uh, landed in any particularly uh, significant way in Canada, unless you were working within the international development sector. And even then, our engagement was largely focused on kind of bilateral aid. So I wanted to paint a little bit of a picture about how the Millennium Development Goals are quite different from the SDGs, even though they're both three-letter acronyms that sound pretty similar to one another. So first and foremost, the Millennium Development Goals were an agenda that focused on uh, what we, we would have called and still call in some contexts developing countries. This was really meant to be uh, an agenda that helped address challenges being faced by developing countries, and, and Canada's role was really as a bilateral funder to help other countries develop. Um, we've learned a lot in the international development context through the years that this is really uh, not um, uh, in appropriate context, and in fact that many of the issues that are being faced in developing countries are issues we experience here at home as well. Uh, and so unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which were really about Canada looking at other places and trying to help, um, the SDGs are really uh, a universal agenda. They are both domestic and they are international in nature. So this is really a set of goals that we need to think about in the context of our own organizations, our own communities, uh, and in the context of Canada, um, as well as an agenda that can really help uh, uh, us think through our meaningful engagement with countries uh, around the world. Um, Next is the indicator coverage. At the end of the day, we're gonna talk a little bit about data today, but really I wanna talk more about the kind of high level opportunity that the SDGs present. Uh, the indicator coverage of the Millennium Development Goals wasn't particularly substantive. The goals weren't universal. They were focused on a specific set uh, of eight goals, 21 targets, uh, and under, underpinned with 60 indicators. Uh, the SDGs, again, uh, are a much more robust data set, so it gives us actually a unique and much deeper opportunity to understand our impact as organizations, uh, as communities, as, as a country. Um, there are 17 goals, but underneath those 17 goals are a really deeply interconnected set of 169 targets and 230 indicators. Um, and what's actually most important is not the number of targets and indicators that they are, but how the SDGs requires us to think about data. Um, the, the, the slogan of the SDGs, we can problematize the language, is leave no one behind. But what that means from a data perspective is that at, in past indicators, if we were to take the Millennium Development Goals and look internally, or if we take the Livable Cities Index or any of the indices around the world, uh, through rose-colored glasses, Canada's often pretty high up on that list. This is not a bad spot to be. Education is good, healthcare is good, there are economic opportunities, et cetera, except if you disaggregate that data and you look at subpopulations, you look at people that are traditionally marginalized. 
Um, if you look at Canada's Indigenous populations and communities, we are failing outright and abysmally. Uh, and so what the SDGs requires is actually that uh, this data doesn't paint an aggregate picture of how Canada is doing on these 17 goals, but actually requires us to look at every single subpopulation, uh, including those that are most traditionally and historically marginalized. And if we fail to meet the goals for any one of those populations, we have failed. We know that if we want to get towards meeting some of these very complex challenges, this isn't something that any individual organization, any individual sector or group is going to be able to accomplish. It really needs to be uh, um, a cross-sectoral, cross-place, cross-definition agenda. Um, the SDGs break down silos between places. I mentioned that they're universal. This is a set of goals for our community, for Canada, and for the world. Um, it breaks down silos between definitions. Um, there are a lot of different definitions of sustainability, and we could spend the whole morning and the whole day trying to figure out what it is. But at a really high level, this is one of the most robust definitions of sustainability insofar as it actually defines sustainability through its environmental or ecological, its economic, and its social dimensions. Uh, and so this is a much broader definition than we might have used uh, historically when we think about environmental sustainability or when we use sustainability in the context of international development. It breaks down silos between the issues. So I talked about that data framework. Yes, there are 17 goals, but as you go down into the indicators and sub-indicators, you can actually see how interconnected those goals are. So this isn't just about bringing together poverty reduction agencies to work better together on poverty, bringing together food insecurity or, or uh, hunger-focused agencies to work better on reducing food insecurity in, in Canada or globally. Uh, it is really about breaking down the silos between all of these issues and recognizing how interconnected they are and how interconnected uh, our relationship with land, nature, and ecology is with our relationship to the place that we live in cities and communities. Th this is an agenda that actually requires policy coherence and inter departmental participation. Um, Community Foundations of Canada is based in Ottawa. I don't live there. Um, but this is actually a major challenge for the federal government right now because it requires one hand to know what the other is doing. It requires then what, that when one policy is formulated, it isn't uh, obstructing another policy and it isn't obstructing our collective ability to work uh, as a country forward uh, towards advancing these goals. Uh, it is cross-sectoral. The SDGs, again, were built with all sectors in mind. And while I would love to say that civil society was at the heart of that and that we really were driving the agenda from day one in September of 2015, actually the private sector was some of the first organizations globally to sign on to this agenda. Uh, and there are large multilateral organizations that recognize that this is the future that we need that are actually uh, not only thinking about their CSR activities, but fundamentally rethinking about how they're running their business so that they uh, are, are producing less of the negative externalities that they might have produced in, in past years. Uh, and lastly, it, it's an attempt at breaking down silos between people. Uh, again, we talked a little bit about the leave no one behind adage. This is really an agenda that was uh, built through uh, participation and community consultation at a scale that the UN ha had never undertaken before. This was driven by community, uh, and it really requires the participation of everybody if we're actually going to get towards um, uh, meeting these goals by 2030. Uh, really simply put, um, the SDGs are a shared language, or at least a best attempt at a shared language. Um, and while that's a pretty simple statement, it's actually pretty transformative when you think about what it means for our ability to work again uh, across geographies, how we can start to share knowledge, share information in, in a reliable and a data-driven way with organizations that might be like ours but that are operating in a different part of the world, or how we can actually think about the issues that are, uh, we're facing in our communities with a common language that might be spoken by government. I, I've been spending years trying to figure out government speak. I haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. So there might actually be a shared language there or, or to connect with the private sector. Um, recently, a guy named Arthur Bull came up to me. He runs the Rural Nova Scotia's Community Foundation. And he said, JP, we're all about the SDGs in rural Nova Scotia. And I said, why? That, that, that kind of shocked and surprised me at this early stage in the game. And he said, well, we've been fighting a battle to protect oceans and fisheries for three decades, and nobody's been listening. And we, for the first time, have an opportunity to speak the same language as others in our community uh, about the, the importance of protecting oceans. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's an attempt at a shared measurement system. We don't all have to pivot and measure to the SDGs, but we can triangulate using the SDGs. And so very quickly, we can understand uh, how one organization's work compares to another uh, and build a picture that is cohesive enough to really get to the root of where the gaps are as we think about this 12-year journey we're going to be on connected to the SDGs. So that brings us to the question of how Canada is doing. Guesses? Thumbs down? Thumbs down? Haley, you know, so you yeah, thumbs down. Um, 
there's a lot of different indices that show how Canada is doing. And again, I think as we're really jumping into this space, there's going to be even more data available. Um, this was a chart. I like it because it's very simple. It was produced by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, who recently launched their Canadian division at the University of Waterloo to help connect uh, organizations across sectors, but particularly to bring the, the, the robust value of academia into this conversation about the sustainable development goals. Uh, and really quickly, if you've, if you've ever seen or stopped at a stoplight, this is pretty much how it works. Uh, there are three places, generally speaking, in which Canada is, is meeting or is likely to meet its requirements within the current system under the SDGs. Uh, yellow, we've got uh, some work to do, and red, we are failing quite abysmally at this point in time. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, just a couple of statistics that speak to some of these yellows and these red areas. Uh, in 2015, almost 5 million Canadians or 1 in 7 people lived in poverty. This included over 1 million children. Um, in 2014, women reported 1.2 million violent incidences, including physical assault, sexual assault, and robbery. As of the 31st of October in 2017, there were uh, at least 100 drinking water advisories in First Nations communities that had been in place for over a year. Between 1990 and 2015, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions have been on the rise. Uh, and there's, this is, you know, five data points, four data points of many, many more that really underpin the colors that were up on that board. So we actually have work to do, and that work, again, starts with our own organizations, how we work with one another, and how we think about the future of London. Uh, the Auditor General in, uh, in April of this year put out its first report uh, monitoring the federal government, not Canada's uniform progress, but the federal government's progress towards meeting its commitments under the SDGs about two, two and a half years in. Um, and it was, you know, I know that the red and the green are equal, but it was a pretty scathing report. Um, some of the very high level observations of this report um, were that the federal government had a narrow interpretation of sustainable development. There was not yet a federal governance structure. There was limited national consultation and engagement no national implementation plans, and few uh, locally articulated targets. Uh, there was no system to measure, monitor, and report on national targets. A and there was an incomplete analysis of the policies and programs that were already in place two and a half years into this agenda. So we're, we're kind of late to the game, at least with respect to how the federal government has been thinking about the SDGs. With that said, uh, Statistics Canada has actually been um, a bit of a a diamond in the rough in the context of the global picture because StatsCan has actually played a really fundamental role in shaping the goals and helping to articulate them and in actually working with other countries around the world to help them build their national strategies without having a mandate to do this on their own. Um, they built a, a data framework or developed a data framework. Um, there was a data portal in progress. That data portal in its beta format is now live. So StatsCan is making visible data that hasn't been made visible before. Um, and there are specific examples of, of programs at scale that are being developed um, and implemented by the federal government that are actually helping us make progress towards some of the areas in, where there are gaps, in which there are gaps in Canada. Um, but much more needs to be done. But there's some good news. There's a silver lining here. Uh, and that's, we're starting to catch up. Canada was late to the game. Uh, those that have been doing the SDG work since 2013 have kind of been recognizing the fact that Canada really was largely absent from a lot of the conversations. Um, but a lot of really exciting things are starting to take place. This is just a few of them. Uh, in about a month's time, Canada will, for the first time, voluntarily report to the UN on its own progress. Uh, the federal government will be bringing a delegation to the high-level political forum in New York and will release the first voluntary national review, and it is committed to doing this again. So we're going to actually get um, a perspective from the federal government about how Canada is doing. Um, and I know that they are working as well to provide disaggregated uh, pictures as, uh, I think, looking at 36 communities right now uh, across the country where they're, they're actively kind of diving deep on local-level data. Um, again, StatsCan has launched a, a beta of its data portal. I know that they have intentions to build it out uh, in substantive ways. And so when we think about the future for vital signs, or we think about uh, mapping our own organization's work and data to the national picture, um, more and more data is going to be made av available and transparent. Um, budget 2018 actually articulated a vision for Canada's progress towards the SDGs for the first time. Um, part of that was a $50 million allocation over 12 years to Statistics Canada to really make sure that we're doing the data piece well and that that data is accessible and available. And there's a lot of data that Canada actually isn't collecting yet. So entirely new systems need to be developed to make sure that we can track our progress. Um, and it also, a, a very modest allocation of 70 million across departments to develop programs to work towards these goals. So, and there's multiple pages in budget 2018 that are worth reading that, that are a positive sign. 
Um, and actually the most important thing is all of this talk about the government being late to the game has spurred other sectors and other organizations to just say, why are we waiting? Like, why are we sitting here waiting? Let's just start doing. Uh, and so there's been this emergence of some really incredible um, you know, cross-sector networks taking a, a national picture, national look at Canada, and really activating their communities, their constituents, their sectors around the SDGs. This is just a couple of them. Uh, SDSN Canada launched in Waterloo, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Alliance 2030, which is actually a collaboration between uh, hundreds of organizations across the country, including community foundations. UN Global Compact, really thinking about meaningful ways to engage the private sector in this space. The Waterloo Global Science Initiative, I'm gonna leave Julie to share the punchline of some of the exciting work that they're doing right now uh, to bring uh, people together across the country and really uh, plan how we're going to work together better. Um, uh, SIX, which is a, a global social innovation network, is actually uh, founding SIX Canada to really think about the direct implications of social innovation on the SDGs. And this is just a, an early example of some national networks. And the most exciting part about these networks is that they're actually talking to each other a lot. Um, we're all hanging out all the time, and there's a lot of synergy that's being fostered between these sectors and these networks. So lots to be excited about. StatsCan, again, is really running now, especially since the Auditor General's report has come out, to make sure that they can collect the data that's, that we need to collect. So this is just a really quick look at uh, the, the totality of the number of indicators under each goal, uh, and then obviously the filled in part of the bars represent the indicators that Canada can actually measure right now. Um, one of the most substantive gaps is actually in understanding uh, our environmental and ecological impact. And so I know that there's been robust conversations between StatsCan, Environment and Climate Change Canada and others to figure out how we can actually collect and share and make visible this important data. The most important thing is that individual organizations are talking about this. Um, we didn't know that. In June of 2017, we started a national conversation on Canada and the SDGs and just went from community to community to ask a really simple question. Have you heard of these things and are you thinking about them? Uh, and we were actually pretty shocked and surprised by, uh, by what we heard. 89% uh, of our participants had agreed that the SDGs was a useful framework for their work. This was a cross-sector group. Um, two-fifths were already starting to think about how to align their data to the SDGs, and this was going back a year. So uh, individual local organizations had this on their radar. Uh, one of the things we heard across all of our sessions was, uh, we were thinking about it, we didn't realize you were thinking about it, huh? And wouldn't it be great if there was a central space to continue this conversation? And so that's really where some of these national networks are starting to play a role. And the momentum is building. Um, and so that's really why we're here today. Um, there's been a lot of great conversations at a national level. There have been individual organizations that have been uh, thinking about the context of the SDGs in relation to their own work. There are new national networks forming and there's a federal government now that is stepping up and starting to run uh, more quickly than it has. And so now we really wanna think today about what does this mean for London? What does this mean for our own organizations and how we work together uh, to really help continue it to build on this momentum, to localize it uh, and to get to 2030 and possibly not see the next uh, massive agenda that articulates all these things we fail to meet uh, in the next 12 years.